Oh, man, what a, an amazing selection of songs. Come on, I, I was about to get lost on that blessing song. That song was just written, by the way, if you don't know it. Uh, Steve, uh, Steve Furtick and, and Carrie Job and, and the husband and the, uh, bun- yeah, Cody and a bunch of, bunch of them just wrote that, which is like a prescription God wrote, you know, a couple of weeks ago for what's going on right now. And uh, the blessings uh, beat curses. Um, in, the, in the Bible, um, people would suffer with a curse to the third and fourth generation, but blessings go to the thousandth generation because it's superior in every way. And it's critical that we adjust our thinking, our anticipation, our expectation, our prayers, or everything according to the lifestyle of heaven, the way God thinks, the way he lives. And uh, he's not intimidated about anything. If, uh, you know, D- decide who's going to shape your thinking. D- decide, hurry. <laughs> if you have more input from the media than you do from the Word of God, your depression is your responsibility. Your discouragement, your heaviness of heart is self inflicted. Turn the thing off and turn this thing on. I'm I'm serious. Just uh, adjust. Why? Because we've been called to be an influence in the midst of difficulty and calamity. It doesn't matter what the situation is. We are always there to be uh, not the, we are not the answer, but we usher in the answer through the wonderful, wonderful message of the gospel. And this is the privilege that we have as, as believers. An illustration I've been using for the last several years seems to be even more fitting than it has been in recent times. And that is uh, what you see in scriptures. You see that uh, uh, Israel in the wilderness, um, when it was uh, in the heat of the day, God would manifest as a cloud, a covering, a shelter to bring coolness. In the cold of the night, he was there as a pillar of fire. He shows up opposite to his surroundings. So how does he show up in a virus, in a pandemic? He shows up as the solution the redemptive solution to bring healing to people's bodies. I agree completely with what Chris just led in in prayer, is this is supposed to be the ignition point, the ignition point for a massive healing revival, unlike the world has ever seen, I believe eclipsing what took place in the 50s, which was the greatest thing I believe the world had ever seen, the things that took place in that particular period of time. I remember talking to one of the revivalists, uh, a man who was alive during that era to see what God was doing. And he told me at one time there would be up to 350 revival tents scattered all across the nation with miracles taking place unlike anything had been seen before. And I believe what God is, uh, is doing right now is going to eclipse that. But we've got to position our hearts for that. And so our online community, this is, uh, uh, we always are thrilled that you are there, but, but we, you just grew in number uh, because <laughs> we won't let our people come to church today. So, and uh, we'll let you know week by week what we're doing. Um, but we're really, really thankful for our online community. And uh, today, I uh, just want to bless all of you. We're going to receive communion at the end if you joined us just recently. We're going to receive communion at the end of the service. We've got these uh, a little uh, cups set up with the wafer included. Uh, so I would inclu- encourage you, those of you that are at home or your place of business, if it's possible at all for you to get communion supplies together, I'd like for you to do that so that you can join us. I believe it's going to be a prophetic release of power for us, our church family, our households, as well as... Um, for this nation and the nations of the world. So I want us to look today at uh, Psalms 91. So if you'd open your Bibles to that, um, do that please. By the way, I want to suggest that everybody uh, download uh, the antivirus software called the power of the Holy Spirit. the antivirus software. His name is Jesus. And he is manifest through the power of the Holy Spirit. It is not a philosophy. He remains a philosophy. You're vulnerable to the virus. To, to all, all, all things cruddy. So I, I, just, I just declare 
the good news that Jesus is our antivirus software. And uh, hopefully every one of us can find uh, something to really grab hold of out of this 91st Psalm uh, today. So it's my personal conviction. Uh, I, I No guilt or shame for anybody who is suffering with this virus, please. Uh, we pray for it that, that as a result of our gathering today, that multitudes of people would be absolutely healed, a visitation of God. In fact, we're going to set something up in the, in the coming uh, weeks where people with the virus will be able to call in or do FaceTime or something. Kevin Dedman had a suggestion this week. So we're going to try to figure out how we can do that and have, uh, have our phones, our, our screens occupied by believing believers and pray for people around the world with this uh, disease. Because we're, we're, we believe that in every hellish situation, Jesus has predetermined to get vindication. He has predetermined to reverse the effects into the promotion of the gospel. Uh, he didn't start this thing, but uh, he, uh, he is prepared to reverse its effects. So um, what, if, uh, what if fear threw a party and nobody showed up? That's, that's kind of what I'm thinking about this whole thing. That's, this is just my opinion, but I, I believe the virus is real. I, be, I believe it's very serious, but I believe what's happening around the nations is 5% virus and 95% fear. And right now, it seems to me that virus is, is riding the wings of fear. And uh, you, can't, you, know, you can't embrace fear and love. The embracing of fear is the rejection of love. And we're going to look in this particular study today that the love of God is one of the things that abiding in love actually repels uh, affliction, infirmity, and helps us to live in grace. All right, enough of the warm-ups. Let's just get into the word. And uh, let's begin with verse one. In fact, you know what? I want to read the whole psalm, and then we're going to back up and go back through verse by verse, all right? So let's just read the whole thing. <clears throat> I'm reading out of uh, New King James. Uh, the title of the psalm is Safety of Abiding in the Presence of God. And here's my prayer. I believe that the manifest presence of God upon his people is the key to divine health. Yes. And learning to host him, learning to yield to, her, to him, Learning to cooperate with him is what he is going to train us in and teach us in uh, in this particular season. Come on in, guys. Yeah. Come on in. We've got a worship team looking for places to sit. So just come on in. We've got seats all over here. So, And those of you online, just crawl through the screen. No, I'm just kidding. All right. <clears throat> all right. Uh, verse 1 of Psalms 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers. Under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer, with, answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. This is a, is a, a wonderfully well-known psalm because of its, the element of safety, the element of protection, the element, element of, 
of vind vindication in a sense uh, throughout this psalm. So I, I want us to go through this because I believe there are some specifics that the Lord would want us to take hold of today, especially in light of this that is going on all over the world. And um, today is supposed to be the day where we start a revival series. I am. <laughs> I am. But we're going to restart. But I am. This is what I'm doing. This is just, this is, this is revival flavored antivirus software is what it is. All right. He who dwells, verse one, this, we're going to go through verse by verse. All right. So please follow with me in your Bibles. <clears throat> he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. Stop right there. He who dwells, you remember the scripture talks about abiding in Christ. If we abide in him, his words abide in us. When it talks about dwelling in the shelter of the Almighty, we're not talking about a point of theology. We're talking about a lifestyle. In other words, it's not just a verse you've memorized. It's supposed to be the developing of an ongoing lifestyle of a consciousness, an awareness of the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. Many people stop short of a divine encounter because they're satisfied with good theology. The word is the invitation to meet the person. This is not supposed to be just a verse I quote. That's valuable. It's supposed to be the endeavor of my heart is the discovery of the manifest presence of God upon me as a surrendered son, upon me as a yielded vessel. He says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Almighty shall abide under the shadow of his wings, the shadow of the Almighty. The shadow is a dark place. I'll never forget, I, my grandmother, my, my mom's mom, uh, she was losing her eyesight. And, uh, and so many of us would read. I would take turns reading to her uh, from the scripture. She would memorize entire Psalms and my uncle would memorize books of the Bible. They were just in, into that memory thing, which becomes contagious after a while, you know. And I would sit down. I remember she wanted me to read to her a, a particular book by Corey Ten Boom. And in this book, it was, as I recall, it was some sort of a, uh, of a devotional uh, book that she had written. And in this book, she talked about dwelling under the shadow of the Almighty. And she made this statement, and I've never been able to shake it, thankfully. She made this statement that sometimes it's dark because he's so close. Sometimes it's his nearness that causes things to be out of focus. It's that shadow of presence. And sometimes we, we mistake the moment that we're in by, by natural interpretation instead of the realization of what Scripture says. Scripture says you're in the shadow of the Almighty. So the people who turn their affection towards the ongoing manifestation of the abiding presence of the Spirit of God, those people dwell in a habitation that even when it's dark, it's only a testimony of his nearness. Verse 2. <laughs> All right, I'm back, I think. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress and my God, in him I will trust. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. <clears throat> This is the only um, proactive uh, position in the psalm. One is implied later, but this one is the, the action point of this psalm. And it's, I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge, my portion. In him I trust. I always take this and I turn it into a personal declaration. God, you are the one that I trust. You are, you are my refuge. And, and for years, when I come to that, I don't like the wording because I want to make it personal. And then it hit me, 
The wording is chosen for a reason. We are so, supposed to confess and declare that he is our trust. But this is actually a confession we are to make to one another. I will say of the Lord. It's important that we guard what we say to people, to one another, to the community. You're in the grocery store. Yesterday I was on a plane flying back from New Mexico from a healing conference of all things, packed with people that were living the antivirus thing, you know. And I sat next to a lady who, she said, I, I wish I didn't have to fly. I'd rather not be in here. And she was wiping everything down with uh, sanitizing cloth, which, which I, I think is smart. Let me come back to that. Common sense needs to be embraced. Just don't let common sense be the hiding place of fear. There, there are some people that are, that are saying right now, um, taking any precaution is an act of fear. Now, don't be stupid. Don't play with a rattlesnake and call it faith. All right, I feel better. So the lady next to me was wiping everything down. She said, would you like one of these? I said, no, I've got the liquid stuff. I've already done it. I'm, I'm good, you know. She said, I, I wish I didn't have, have to fly. I'm, you know, she's just very afraid. And that's where you step in and just... Just you don't want, ever want to make somebody feel ashamed for their fear. You don't ever want to do that. You just want to throw them a lifeline. That's all. Don't don't make people feel guilty because they're struggling with fear. Because you know some people have lost loved ones. Other people have they have a history of sickness. They've got a reason for it. You know don't don't make people feel guilty for for their struggle. Just throw them a lifeline. Just be hope centered. Both hopelessness and hope are contagious. Choose how, how infectious you want to be. All right. So he, here it is. He says, he will, uh, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God, and him I will trust. So when I was thinking about this, here's this passage in um, <clears throat> Colossians. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. What is that? It's actually a confession of truth, scripture, and even in song. It's interesting, they would apply psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Psalms are biblical songs. Hymns are things that were written, in, uh, things, songs that have been written. Spiritual songs are the spontaneous. And they actually, there are times for them to be sung to each other, which is not a practice that we, that we do, but we should maybe learn how to do it. Except some of you just sing softly. I'm, that, was a bad, that was a bad joke. That was a bad, bad joke. It was, yeah, that was like when Chris went to visit my dad when he was in his final days. Chris said, I feel like I'm supposed to sing over you. And, and, and my dad asked him to sing on a hill far away. <laughs> And he said, you mean the song on a hill far away? He says, no, on a hill far away. So, yeah. But he was always good with a good sense of humor. Psalm, oh, excuse me. So here it says, I will say of the Lord. There's another place in Isaiah 35 where it says, and I'll just read it to you quickly here. It says that we say to the one with weak knees, with feeble heart, be strong, take courage. And the very next verse says, then the eyes of the blind will be opened. Then the, the ears, the tongue of the dumb will be loosed. It's, it's guarding what we say to each other. Being, being intentional in our decrees to one another is a huge part of this thing we call faith. This life of faith this thing that we call the faith that we are in, this faith in Christ, this walk with Christ. It's the, it's the caution, but it's the proactive um, position of declaring what God has said, what God is saying in this environment and not feeding and fueling uh, uh, this, this fear element that is gripping so many people's hearts. So here's the one intentional action in this psalm is I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God, and him will I trust. Verse three, surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler 
and from the perilous pestilence. To me, this implies snare the fowler. <clears throat> they would set a trap for a bird to catch, to catch a bird. Fowler, snare. He will deliver you from the snare. To me, it implies that maybe you got caught in the snare and he's going to release you. So if, 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 you, if you didn't get the protection you're supposed to get to keep you from the snare, once you're in it, he's going to release you. The whole point is, so all of you that are watching, some of you are in absolute divine health, others of you are struggling. He will deliver you from the snare. If you got caught in this snare, it's not shame, it's not condemnation. We live in a world of sin. We get exposed to stuff, and it's not your fault. The good news is he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Verse 4, he will cover you with his feathers. Under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. A buckler is a small shield, so it's more of a hand-to-hand -hand combat type uh, picture. All right. I, I always quote this verse when people complain about feathers appearing in our meetings. <laughs> he shall cover you with his feathers. Well, that's not literal, Bill. And I'd say, I know, that's what I thought. All right. Verse, verse five. Verse five. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. This is important. The distinction. In, in the New Testament, the arrows are the, the enemy's thoughts. You, you remember the, the, the example of uh, the armor of God, the shield of faith. It's to absorb, the shield of faith is to absorb the thoughts, the ideas, the suggestions, the temptations, all the junk that the enemy throws our way. So that's what the, the arrow comes during the day when you're alive and thinking. At night is the terror. And so he's, he's, he's distinguishing. If, if you go to bed with fear, you, you are, you're embracing this thing that says I could, something could happen in the night. It's that, it's that thing that foreboding spirit that Chris deals with a lot. The, the expectation or anticipation of something wrong happening. Oh man, I hope our family member, I hope, I hope something bad doesn't happen to this person, that person. That foreboding spirit is that terror in the night. And so the Lord is actually equipping us to take a position, shield and buckler, the, 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 the shield of faith to absorb the stuff that comes at us during the day, but to do it so well during the day that when it's time to go to bed, we can go to sleep in rest, knowing that he will defend us. Now I'm going to throw in a word. It's not a biblical word. It's a word. It's, it's the one of two times in my life I've had the Lord wake me up in the middle of the night with his voice. It happened about, um, oh goodness, 23, probably 23 years ago, here soon after we came to Reading. We've been here, I think it's 24, maybe it's 25 years. I, I lose track. 24 years. 24 years this last month. So it was about maybe 23 years ago. I was awakened in the night with this phrase. He watches over the watch of those who watch the Lord. He watches over the watch of those who watch the Lord. Of course, we know uh, in pondering, after I heard that, he awakened me with that voice. I don't ever want to equate that with scripture. I'm just saying he spoke something to me that was important for me to hear in that season, but also right now. He watches over the watch. We know what a watchman is. A watchman is positioned on a wall to see what might be coming towards the city. Good, good news here. We have people coming into trade. Open the gates. Bad news here. We have, uh, we have people trying to sneak into the city, city to kill, steal, and destroy. And so the watchman keeps awake. And this verse said, he will watch over my watch if I'll watch him. So this terror by night thing is that, is that we go to sleep literally with our eyes on him, knowing that he will watch our watch on our behalf. Amen. Bill, that was an excellent point. All right. Let's, uh, uh, verse six is basically the same thing. Nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Verse seven, a thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. I, I want to be careful here. First of all, the judgment verses in the Old Testament, I don't want to ignore. 
I don't want to wash them away and pretend they don't exist. That's not healthy, nor is it accurate. Whenever I see a, a, a person who lives in corruption, in evil, it doesn't matter how deep they are lost, I always am praying for mercy. I don't care how lost they are, how, you know, how demonized they are, how <clears throat> they may be a self-proclaimed devil worshiper. It makes no difference to me. I'm going to pray for the mercy of God. But I will let you in on a secret. <clears throat> if I, in my prayer, Lord, if they absolutely refuse to repent and they will not turn, then please use your dealings with them to release the fear of God to the people of God. Awaken us to this, to this reality. Now, another thing I need to say is just because you have difficulty or are struggling or you're sick or whatever, that's not the judgment of God. All right, so anybody who's watching online here, we're going to pray for this at the end. It's not the judgment of the Lord. That's not what he's doing. This is uh, uh, quite a different deal here. All right, verse 9. Let's move on from that. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, referring back to verse 1, no evil will befall you, nor shall any plague near, come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Let's go back over verse 10 and 11 again. I'm sorry, verse 9. Because, so here's a reason. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor any plague come near your dwelling. Stop right there. I just want to reemphasize learning to live in the manifestation of the, of the presence of God, the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. I, I, cannot, I cannot overemphasize the importance of us learning to live with continuous affection for the person of the Holy Spirit. There's something about that abiding presence. It's not just that he protects us. It's, it's the, the closer I stay to his heartbeat, the more I know what to do in a difficult moment. The disciples come to Jesus and say, why couldn't we cast the demon out of the child? Jesus says it only comes out with prayer and fasting, and he didn't pray or fast. Why? Because the tenderness, the closeness was already there. The devil was on his shoulder and remained. So there was a continuous, ongoing relationship and awareness of the Spirit of God. So he didn't need to turn aside. What is fasting for? It's to refine our focus to the kingdom. It's to say no to other appetites so that we can truly hunger for the, the reality of the unseen promises of God that are to become manifest. That's what it is. Fasting is refining focus. Jesus didn't fast in the moment. Why? He lived with a refined focus. He lived with the connection to the abiding presence of the Spirit of God. So this promise here is not just this casual, the Holy Spirit is with us always thing. It's the invitation to develop an awareness of the Spirit of God upon our life in such a way. It's not just to protect me from plagues. It's to, it's to keep me in the center of what he is doing on planet earth. It makes me the, the offensive weapon, if you will, the one who can bring hope in hopeless situations, the one who refused to, to cower in the face of threat and disease and all the junk that goes on, unwilling to cower. I will not, I will not give honor to a disease. I will not give honor to a disease. Cancer is with a small c. Jesus is a capital J. Always keep it big. It may seem silly to you, but that's, that's what's going on in my head. All right. Because you've made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. So here's two people have a conversation. Because you've made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. No evil will befall you. How about seeing people that live in that abiding presence and making that confession over them? Realities are released through decree. Not what we choose to say. 
I mean, life and death is still in the power of the tongue, but you know, I'd, I'd rather just make sure I'm saying what he's saying. <clears throat> but how about being in that moment where you can look at somebody and say, you know what? I've got a good word for you. No evil will come near your tent. No evil will befall you. It's got to be declared. Chris, you remember that time you prophesied about the, the people who couldn't have kids They were trying for 13 years or whatever, and the Lord spoke to, spoke to Chris and said, tell them to have a child by this time next year. And he was struggling, as every one of us would be, <clears throat> to make that kind of a declaration to somebody who, who couldn't have children. And the Lord spoke to him and said, if you don't declare it, if you don't say it, it won't happen. And so he did, and they did. Some things actually have to be declared to happen. We, we have to understand we are a part of that economy. That's, that's who we are. That's how we live. That's how we function. Verse 10, no evil will befall you, nor any plague come near your dwelling. Why? For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they will bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. <clears throat> I, as, as most of you know, <clears throat> one of my uh, dearest friends is, um, is Randy Clark. I was just with him in uh, New Mexico. And uh, he tells the story of his time of ministry uh, in uh, Argentina and Brazil both. But in Argentina, one of the leaders that he was learning from and partnering with as he ministers in that country made, made a statement to him, and I, I'm not going to get it exact, but I'll get the gist of it, told him that basically you in, in the American church know a lot about uh, operating in the gifts of the Spirit, but you don't know how to partner with the angelic. Now, personally, I do not believe in me telling angels what to do. I, 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 won't go, I won't go there. I will not go there. But what I will do is I have found that in Scripture, our decrees let the angelic realm know what their assignment is. Our decrees when we say what he is saying. I, I would like to suggest that a decree that comes from the throne room carries the fragrance of the Father carries the fragrance of its origin. There's something about that, that the angelic realm have a sense. This came from the throne room, and this is their assignment. In Psalms 103, it says that angels carry out his word. In my thinking, that's when God declares the matter. There are sometimes he just declares the matter. That's their assignment. You can vote yes, you can vote no. Doesn't matter. It's going to happen anyway. <clears throat> but, the, but the second part of the verse says that the angels give attention to the voice of his word. In my experience, I believe the voice of his word, that's you and me. It's when God speaks in the quiet of our heart, and unless we declare it, it goes unsaid. So if you can picture this, saying something that had its origin in the throne room, and we make that decree, his angels will give charge over you. That's a part of this confession that is made from one to another. His angels will give charge over you. What happens? As that comes from the heart of God himself, the angelic realm knows that's their assignment. I'm just supposing that's how it works. I know that in, in the natural world, we know flies are attracted to decay. Satan is called the Lord of the flies. The demonic realm is attracted to decay in thought, in morals, values. That's why what we say is going to attract one of two worlds. That's why there's life and death in the power of the tongue. Guarding ourselves to deposit in one another not just hopeful words, but actually putting on them a bullseye that the angelic realm will reinforce. Wow. That's our assignment. A people of courage that must deposit the bullseye, if you will, of the target of God in this situation. And it's a, it's a lifestyle that we have the privilege of living. He will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Let's, let's go to verse 13. 
You will tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. This is a passage that Jesus uh, quotes, at least in part, in the Gospel of Luke. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Here's an important thought in this passage. This whole psalm is about protection until this verse. (laughs) Then it basically says the protected are going to get vindication. The protected (laughs) are going to get vindication. The protected are going to trample on the very efforts of darkness to kill, steal, and destroy. The protected, the ones who have been kept in safety, the ones that death, a thousand fall at your side, 10,000 at your your other side, those folks are now released to tread upon the powers of darkness that caused caused the uh, disaster in the first place. We We are summoned not to sit idly by and just pray, oh God, please protect me, protect me. Please keep me from harm. To think that way is, is, almost, is almost yielding to the virus. Is, in this case, the, the coronavirus. But just in general, in the life of a believer, to just try to be the protected, safe person is the opposite of our calling, the opposite of our design. The opposite. The safest place in the kingdom is the front lines of battle. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Jesus made that statement to his disciples. He brought it into New Testament context. Verse 14, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, I will answer him, I will be with him in trouble. Go back to verse 14. Let's cover just that one for a moment. Because he has set his love upon me, Therefore, I will deliver him. Who does the deliverance come, from, come to? The people who set their love on him. <clears throat> I don't want to twist the meaning of this, so again, everything, do everything to resist any kind of guilt, shame, or whatever. To me, this is an invitation by God to learn what it is to fix the affection of our hearts, to be anchored in him continuously. He he makes a point for a reason. Because he set his love on me, I deliver him. I know uh, when I'm home, I I tell my wife that I love her uh, many times a day. Many times a day. Uh, many times, sometimes during a meal. Uh, It's going to be repeated frequently. I'm going to reset. I've already set my love on her, but I reset. See, in Acts chapter two, it says, and they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to prayer, to fellowship, et cetera. They continually continually devoted. They continually re-upped the contract, re-signed the contract. There's something about this passage that provokes me. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. There's something about the ongoing, I hate to reduce it to a discipline, but if that's what it takes, do it. The ongoing resetting of our affection for him throughout a day. If you need it, set it on your alarm to remind you. The resetting of our heart of affection for him. 
There's something about that. He's such a lover that he's drawn. You know, I've, I've talked about this for the year, through the years. But I, uh, in going to sleep at night, I turn my affection towards him. When I go into a difficult situation, I'll stop, turn my affection towards him until I can sense his presence resting upon me. It's not that he wasn't before, but something happens. Either he comes or I become aware. I don't care what it is, I like it. Turn my affection towards him and something happens in that moment where there, there is a manifest presence of God upon me for whatever environment I walk into. And I've, I've, I've told you before, um, I, I remember a store I used to shop in that uh, it was a grocery store, but it had cultic stuff there too. And, and I loved to shop there. And I remember the owner taking me aside one day. Before I'd walk in, I'd just stand at the door. I was at, I'd go to the back door, I'd just stand at the door and and just turn my affection towards the Lord, make sure that I could sense the Spirit of God resting upon me. Then I would walk in and just shop. I I wouldn't do anything different than anyone else. But the owner took me aside one day and said, Bill said, something is different when you walk in the room. I know it's because the manifest presence of God resting upon me. So this is what he's saying. He said, because you set your love on me, therefore I will deliver. So I I just pray right now that every one of us upgrade that resetting of the affection of our heart for him. Not just reduced to a discipline, but the increasing passion of the Lord would become our passion. I remember a prophetic word I heard, oh goodness, it was probably 1972, it was before I was married, which was 73. I I remember sitting in in a service in Bethel Church, the other old location, and this, this woman prophesied, and she said, um, uh, if you long for me as I've longed for you, you will be satisfied. Ah, if you long for me. What does it mean to set your love on God? It means you've received his love. Do you know that? Do you know the scripture says we love him because he first loved us? Do you know when I love him, I am only love him, him back with what he gave me? He, when I opened up my heart to receive his love, he gave me the capacity to love him back. Strangely, in scripture, you see instruction on the husband to love the wife, but the wife to respect the husband. Why? Because if the husband does a good job loving the wife, she doesn't need to be commanded to love in return. And all the women said, yes, amen. (laughs) But you you get the point. You get the point. The point is, is, is it's it's actually carried on in the illustration of Christ and his church, the husband and the wife. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. I'm not sure what it means. My mind goes quickly to being seated in heavenly places. And it's that particular passage, uh, we are seated in heavenly places with Christ, is a wonderful, wonderful truth. The problem that I have, not with the verse, but with the issue, is it gets reduced to a point of theology and never becomes an experience. Heavenly places is supposed to be a place from which we think and from which we see. It's not a mind over matter thing. It's not a, you know, discipline our minds to imagine this and imagine that. It's not that. It's that is that our love runs so true with him. The resetting of our hearts of affection towards him becomes so ongoing that we not only have the point of theology that is accurate, we are seated in heavenly places, but we actually think and see from that place because our burning heart of affection for him and his burning heart for us brings us into such a place that our perception changes Everything changes because in that abiding place of presence, we think and we see different. 
See, it's that person that can say to the disease. It's that person, as John G. Lake discovered, to hold the disease in his hand, put it under the microscope and watch it die. Not everyone could have done that. Why? Because not everyone has life flowing from them continuously. If you take a garden hose and you put it in foul, putrid water, whatever's in that puddle is going to leak into the hose. The only way to keep the inside of the hose unaffected is that before you put it into the stuff, make sure the water's turned on. And if there's a continual flow through the hose, you can put it in any environment and it doesn't get infected. We got people setting up barriers of protection around themselves because they don't have enough flowing out. You get the stuff flowing through you, that yieldedness. Yieldedness, not yieldedness just for the sake of power, but yieldedness because of this romance, because of this love, because I've set my heart of affection on it. Suddenly there's stuff flowing from us that starts changing. The atmosphere starts changing the environment that we walk into. We've been called into this for this season. This is the season of advancement. All right, we're getting close to the end. That's right. We'll get you now. <clears throat> Verse 14 again. Look at it in your Bible. Verse 14 again. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high. It's actually a place of, of safety, uh, in a sense, unreachable. Uh, by the way, the scripture teaches pretty clearly that we are out of reach of the enemy, but not out of sight. <clears throat> That's why he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. You're out of reach, but you're, you're not out of sight. Why? I think the Lord loves to torment the devil. That's just my thought. I think he rather enjoys. And you know what? You're sitting at, at a table and you've got the enemy all around you. What is your attention on? Any situation where you feel like you're under heavy assault, if you'll, if you'll refine your focus, you'll find the table of fellowship. He prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. If all you see is the enemy, then you need to readjust, get back to what God has said about your life, find the table of communion, but in that table of fellowship with God, is, your, is all of our place of great strength, great confidence, great life, great health. All right, getting down to the end. Verse 15, he shall call upon me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. <clears throat> Verse 15 again, he shall call upon me, I will answer him. I'm not going to go long on this one, but I am so tempted. And let me just tell you why. Continuous answers to prayer are what we were designed for. To not have them is abnormal. And that needs to matter. It needs to matter. What I see happen for us is that we'll pray about this, pray about that, have no breakthrough, and just assume it's the will of God. The disciples tried to cast a demon out of a child. If we could bring that analogy into today, when the child wasn't delivered, we would just assume that in the sovereignty of God, it must be his will. He works in mysterious ways, which is the cop-out answer. It's the cop-out answer to explain away our powerlessness.
I'm trying. <laughs> so what did the disciples do? Jesus comes along. He brings the deliverance. I made reference to it earlier. He brings deliverance to the child. He asks the disciples, how long am I going to be with you? Which seemed to be a question he asked often. <clears throat> how long shall I be with you? And then the disciples, they're stunned by, first of all, they're stunned by the fact they couldn't bring deliverance. Why? Because they have a history of success. Jesus sent them out two by two. He, they've, they've been with him in those moments. They've been in there with him. They are the most trained people in deliverance of anyone to ever live except for Jesus up to that time. And so they're shocked when it doesn't happen. That's a good shock when something doesn't happen. The day's coming when we're going to be shocked when somebody isn't healed. So Jesus brings deliverance, and it says the disciples took Jesus aside privately, and they said, how come we couldn't do it? How come, how come it didn't work when we tried? And it, of course, Jesus said, this kind only comes out with prayer and fasting. What's the point? When they didn't get an answer, they took Jesus aside. What we tend to do is stop praying. It's supposed to bother us enough that we look at the lack of a breakthrough as an abnormality. Something didn't work right. I'm not going to blame it on the sovereignty of God. I'm not just going to say, well, somehow this must be God's will. I'm not going to do the cop-out thing and push it under the sovereignty of God. I'm going to take responsibility and come before the Lord until I find out why. Take Jesus aside. Take Jesus aside. I'm asking all of the Bethel family, uh, online community, and the Reading, the local community, take at least a day this week, if it's physically possible, to fast yeah. and to cry out to the Lord. We, we've, we've got to hone our focus in this season. We have to refine the focus to what God is saying and doing. This is our greatest opportunity for advancement. This is our greatest opportunity. It needs to come in miracle power. It needs to come in economic release, both for businesses, churches, ministries, all over the world are being unbelievably hit by this thing. What has happened? We are being set up for massive, massive revival. How do we know this? Let me give you just one historic uh, lesson. You know, we talk a lot about the Azusa Street Revival. I did not know until yesterday, <clears throat> the Azusa Street Revival is 2006. Excuse me, uh, <laughs> 1906. Maybe I just prophesied. All right. All right. 1906 is the Azusa Street Revival. What I did not know until yesterday is that there were sparks of revival all over the, the United States in, in 1905. And there were about a million, which the country size at that time was very significant, a million new conversions in 1905, which set the stage for an explosion in 1906. What's happening right now? Corporate gatherings around the world of tens of thousands and even hundreds of thousands. We have Louis Palau, we have Franklin Graham, we have so many others in the Calvary Chapel movement. Their uh, evangelists are holding these massive crusades. We've got the send. We've got the call. We've got all these things. Daniel Kalenda. We've got this stuff all over the world of the gathering. Bethel Music and their gathering of tens of thousands of people. All over the world, this stuff's going on. And what's happening right now? All of it is shut down. Why? The enemy fears the impact of that of that. And the assault is on the business community because that's what funds the, the, uh, the movement. This is the moment for vindication, but I believe it takes aggressive prayer on your part and mine where we stand in the gap and we say, not on my shift, not on my shift. What's been happening in the last couple years is 1905 all over again. It's, it's that God has set the stage for an explosion to take place that is to take place right now. We're being positioned for it. If we'll posture ourselves with faith, guard, guard our hearts from those random fearful thoughts where we deny love and embrace fear and position ourselves to find out what God is saying 
and make the decree. Get into the, get into the battle. Get into the fight. Take that time. Take a day to fast. Cry out to God. Lift up your voice. Contend for those who are suffering. We have friends right now, people that I know that have been hit by this thing. They're suffering horribly. We stand in that place. We stand in that place. We make that decree. I took the communion with me this week and just, and just walked in my hotel room, just declaring the names of these individuals. Jesus bore their affliction on his body. He bore yours, mine, on his body. There's no sense two of us paying the same price. No sense. Makes no sense. So here he says, I will be with him in trouble. He says, I will answer him. I will be with him. I, I just, I feel like, do you know where every one of us started our life in Christ? All of us, you could take all of our gifts, all of our history, our heritage, our, all the stuff about our life and just take everything away until you come down to the one common denominator. <clears throat> the one common denominator is we called upon the Lord, he heard us, and he saved us. Our life started with an answer to prayer. Our life started as an answer to prayer. We lifted up our voice. We cried out to God. He met us and he performed the greatest miracle we will ever see in our life. And that's the salvation of our own souls. We started in the miraculous. It was never supposed to decline. It was never supposed to decline. So he says, he'll call upon me. I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. I will be with him in trouble. That tells me sometimes I'm in trouble but he's with me. The table of fellowship is there in the presence. All right. I will deliver him and honor him. That's a strange conclusion. I'm not just going, I like this. I'm not just going to set him free and protect him. I'm not just going to get him out of the snare. I'm going to honor him as one of mine. I'm going to mark him and let him know, let her know that this one follows me. I'm reminded of Gideon's prayer where he told all of his the 300 soldiers around him. As you break these pictures, remember the, they had these torches with pictures over them and as you break those pictures, yell out for the Lord and for Gideon. There are times where he will actually have somebody honor you publicly for your courage. Maybe in front of another friend. I remember as a parent, I, would, uh, I took on uh, the intentionality of bragging on my children while to another adult while my children were present. Yes. 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 I remember when Eric drew on a bedroom wall <laughs> in our house and he drew this city landscape, you know, these high high-rise buildings, you know, with windows and everything. And I got home. Benny said, you need to come and see what Eric did. So I went in and I'm looking at this wall. Eric's standing there like this, you know. I don't remember how old you were, four or five, something like that. So I'm looking at all, you know, he did it with crayons, you know, and uh, marked all over the bedroom, this spare bedroom wall. And I'm looking at these things. I said, son, that's really good. That's he did a good job. Look at these. Look at the honey. Look at the details here. Look at these windows. He drew windows here. He's got big buildings, small buildings. This is amazing. He did a good job. So I went on and praised him for a while. And then I said, you know, next time you want to draw, they'll just let us know. We'll get you paper. <laughs> and then a, a week or so later, we had guests over for, for dinner. We had friends over for a meal. And uh, after the meal, I said, hey, you guys got to come with me. Come see this. Come back in the bed. So I put, took our guests back in their bedroom, and Eric's standing there all happy. And I said, I, said, I just want you to look at my, what my son, the artist, drew, you know, but what Eric drew. Look at this. Look at the details here. Look at the windows. Look at all this stuff. You know, that's what he does. And be the child that realizes the privilege that he promised, and I would honor him. Don't deflect it. Don't deflect it. If we don't know how to receive honor, we'll have no crown to throw at his feet. Last verse. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. 
It's the promise of the Lord to us. Two wonderful things about today. Because there's not another service following, I don't have to tell you to go home. I love that part. And the other part is I don't have to watch the clock. There'll be no parking problem today. There'll be no parking problem. Hebrews is open now. I encourage you to get coffee afterwards. But look at this, look at this, this promise. With long life, I will satisfy him. There's two things there. There's the promise of long life, but the long life is given to satisfy. Uh, I don't know if I can say this very well. The quest for life means I must live longer. Some have lost the quest for life. Some have lost it. They've retired from this. They've quit from that. All they have is just the routine of making it through every day. It's no longer the adventure of faith. For them, it's no longer the conquest. It's no longer bringing in fruit, harvest for his glory. It's just been reduced to just abiding in Christian discipline and fellowship. But there's no quest for life. He says, with long life, I will satisfy him. All right. We're going to share in communion. I want you to stand. You've been sitting forever. If you're at home, please grab your elements. And uh, we're going to share in communion together. And uh, I, I believe more now than ever in the beauty and the power of communion, of the broken body, the shed blood of Jesus. I won't make this as long as I do when it's me and Jesus alone. Because <laughs> I, I like to take time. I like to take time. I like, I, I try to be careful to never do anything just out of a routine. I believe in discipline, but I, I try to make sure that whatever I've disciplined myself in, that I can, that I can turn my passion towards that thing so that so that I am, I am all in. I just always want to be in. No matter what it is, I want to be all in. Jesus, do you need help there, Chris? Or you, <laughs> 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 exactly full meal. <laughs> you got it open. Okay, all right. <laughs> Those of you at home probably don't have this problem of trying to get the combination to work here. Jesus broke bread and he turned to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body. Now, I don't understand this part, but I don't, I don't feel I need to. I just want to honor what he said. He said, this is my body. He didn't say it represents my body. He said, this is my body. So my approach to this is supposed to be with that kind of reverence, with that kind of value. I don't need to understand. I don't need to explain. What I need is to approach it with the value he placed on it. Later in Corinthians, he says, many sick are sick and a number even die because they don't judge the body correctly. He could have been talking about this. He could have, the context, been talking about this. So today... We hold in our hand the testimony of his death, the stripes that he bore. When I partake of the bread, I use that as a moment to declare over myself, my family, my extended family, to declare over them, by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. By the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. I pray for different friends 
by the stripes of Jesus. I've taken you through this in times past. Something I added about three or four months ago is I remembered something out of the book of Ephesians chapter 2 where it says, Jesus bore in his body the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile. He destroyed the power of division with this offering. So I pray not only for people with sickness, disease, friends of mine, based on the payment has been made. I then move into praying. Any place I know where there's division. Jesus, you paid more than an adequate price for there to be no division in that situation. Doesn't matter to me whether it's a family conflict, it's racial uh, reconciliation that needs to happen. Doesn't matter in what category, how large or how small, the payment he made was more than enough. More than enough. So I'm going to ask all of you here, all of you at home, we're going to take maybe two minutes. I want you just to pray for whoever God brings to mind. But I, here, here's what I'm going to have you do that's important in my walk. I have to make it a confession. By the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. By the stripes of Jesus. And then I'll pray for different people, for Kathy Valentin. By the stripes of Jesus, Kathy Valentin was healed. Uh, Eli Spooner was in a very, very tragic accident last night. Very, very tragic. I'm not going to go into it now, but one of our own. And, and we today need to stand in agreement for an absolute creative miracle in his body right now. And you have different people. But let's take like two minutes, and I want you to pray for whoever God brings to mind. You won't be able to cover everything, but let's do the best we can in two minutes. But make the confession, and I'm going to ask you, pray this out loud. No one needs to yell, but I I want to hear the sound of people before God with the value for his body that has been broken for us. Let's do that now. got two minutes. By your stripes I was healed. By your stripes, by the stripes of Jesus, Alan Ray was healed. By the stripes of Jesus, Mary Burke lives in divine health. By the stripes of Jesus, Kathy Valentin is fully restored. Eli Spooner, fully restored. Jean-Luc, fully restored, fully restored entire household, fully restored by the broken body of Jesus. By the broken body of Jesus. Remember, pray both for division areas and healing areas. Declare absolute peace. The peace of God to overwhelm the broken situations, any broken situation in our community. We declare the peace of God rules and reigns over all. All right, now let me pray over this and we'll partake together. I'm glad that these are hard little wafers. The reason is I, I, it's just a reminder to me, it was broken. He was broken that I could be whole. He was emptied that I could be full. He was despised that I could be celebrated. He was rejected that I could be embraced. He bore affliction that I could be healed. He became poor that I could become rich. He did everything in opposite to launch us into what's available right now. So let's just make this decree together. By his stripes, I was healed. I pray for divine health to rest over my household and over our extended church family in the name of Jesus. Amen. Partake of the bread. Now take the cup.
I love this. I love this so much. This is when I, this is when I get to pray for every one of my family members by name. And, uh, and my decree, my confession at this point is, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Say that with me. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I want you to declare it like you actually believe that this is the gospel truth right here, all right? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Say it again. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now what I do is I, I open the cup and I hold it before the Lord and I pray for specific family members. You may not be able to pray for everyone. I'm gonna give you just a minute or two. But in fact, let me tell you what I want you to do. I would like for you to take a minute to pray for family members by name. And this is what I do. I just declare, I plead the blood of Jesus over Eric and Candace, over Kennedy and Selah. And this is my prayer, Jeremiah 24, give them a heart to know you. I plead the blood of Jesus over Brian and Jen, over Haley, Taya, Braden, Moses, and the new little one that's coming because they're adopting another. I plead the blood of Jesus over them. God, give every one of them a heart to know you. I plead the blood of Jesus over Gabe and Leah, over Judah, Diego, Bella, and Cruz. Give them a heart to know you. I want you to do that first. Pray for family members, and then I'll take you into the next phase. Give them a heart to know you, God. Every family member, dreams in the night, encounters, Dreams in the night, divine encounters. <clears throat> prodigal son, prodigal daughters, prodigal parents, uncles, aunts, we just declare, come home, come home. In fact, I pray that every household here, we would see salvation extended to neighbors around us. Next to us, across the street, behind us, there would be this awakening that would take place in home after home where the dreams, the visions of the man in white would no longer just be in Muslim territory, but it would actually invade America. It would actually invade our own cities. The people would be awakened in the night with encounters with the man in white. Now, the next thing I do is I pray over those who, in my case, uh, have uh, opposed me and uh, um, uh, spoken against me, videos, books, whatever, that I pray for them, that they would prosper inside and out, and that they would have the joy of having children and grandchildren that serve him well that they would have a rich heritage in Christ. Because these are all people who confess Christ, who well-meaning as they may be, I'm, I, I, you never have the right to criticize a servant to their master. I will not do that. And so what I do is I pray to bless them. So anybody who has affected you negatively, take just a moment to pray for them. And then we're going to sh share this together. Prosper them inside and out, Lord. Set the stage for them to step into why they were born. That they would have the joy of a rich, rich heritage, family line, richly devoted to you. For what it's worth, I'm always careful to not pray that they would have a, prayer, a power encounter with God because I'm not asking to be vindicated. I pray for their blessing in their context. Let God choose how. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not trying to sneak in my opinion about something. I'm praying for blessing in how they walk, all right? Let's hold the cup before the Lord. 
Let's make this confession together. As for me and my house, As for me and my house we, will we will serve the Lord. Let's share this together. Wow. Thank you, Lord. I would encourage you. I, we have a, a couple uh, little jars next door, a uh, little couch sitting area, and we have jars with communion supplies in there continuously. And, um, and we, we keep it full because for staff members just to be able to take communion at any time. And there's always a number of these cups in there. Today, there was only one left. So I think... Our team has been taking communion more often, <laughs> which is good news. I want to encourage you. I order, I order it on, on Amazon.com. I get these little cups. I have them at home. I take them with me when I travel. It is a part of our household routine. I encourage you guys online, do something. You know, if you want to do the wine and the, and the bread, however, it doesn't matter to me. Just in this season, especially, we need to upgrade our focus and the broken body of Jesus and the shed blood means something. Yes. It's not just eternity. It's now. now. And it must be declared now. Yes. What we're going to do right now is we're going to wrap this up. And obviously, you are the ministry team. And at home, you are the ministry team. <laughs> and so I'm going to ask you here, if you want any prayer at all, turn to the person next to you and just tell them they are drafted. <laughs> they, their assignment is you. And honestly, ask them to pray for you. It may very well be we have people that are watching that don't know the Lord. And, and I want to take this moment. Listen, don't go through life on your own. It's just simply not worth it. It's not worth it. Jesus paid a price for your salvation like he paid for mine. All of us were saved by the absolute grace of God. None of us earned it. I don't care what you've done. You are being set up in this moment to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. It means you turn for what you've, from what you've been serving to follow him. And you do what the verse I, I quoted earlier. He who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. His name is Jesus. Call upon that name, Jesus, and ask him for the absolute full forgiveness of sin. Ask him to fill you with this Holy Spirit. And all of our church family at home, you know what? Now's a great time for you to learn to receive prayer from family members. If you need a miracle, you can't turn to the one next to you unless it's your son or daughter or spouse or whatever. But do that. Take advantage. Pray. God, give us the more. Cause us to be a people with great courage in this moment, not to cower in the face of a virus of all things. No. We come forth. Wash our hands. <laughs> Wash your hands. Don't be stupid. Don't play with a rattlesnake and call it faith. But please, let's go after this thing in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would take the army of God, the Bethel family, but every church across this nation and the nations right now, that there would be a supernatural equipping of courage and faith to stand in the face of this virus and say, back down, go back to your source in the name of Jesus. The enemy came to kill, steal, and destroy, not Jesus. Jesus came with abundant life. So we stand in his name and we declare the all-sufficiency of Christ in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.